For Creamer Media's Policy, I'm Sash Nimadli. Researcher and analyst Professor Raymond Sattner joins me today to discuss his book, Inside Apartheid's Prison. Welcome, Professor. Thanks a lot. Now, your book was first published 16 years ago. Why the need for mm. a new edition? Um, well, you know, the book didn't uh, go very widely then because the primary publisher was an overseas publisher and University of Natal Press, as it then was, uh, didn't bring a lot of copies into the country. And there's quite, there is a fair, fair number, there are a fair number of people who've asked to get copies of it. When I wanted it myself, I've had to order it from America and things like that. Uh, but I was asked to do it, I was approached. And secondly, it is useful to reflect on what my mind was then, what my mind is now. So there's a sort of a dialogue between the introduction mm. and the book itself. But we'll see whether there's a need, depending on uh, what, how many people want it. But there appears on social media to be quite a lot of interest. Mm. You write that in 1969, you put your life at the service of the struggle and bear whatever consequences followed. Why did you make this decision? Well, you know, uh, when I was, before 1969, I was a liberal. I was involved in the Progressive Party youth. And when I got to university, I was still a liberal, although I was no longer in the Progressive Party. I was involved in the Na National Union of South African Students, NUSAS, mm -hmm. and I was closer, I think, to the Liberal Party. But, and I did what I believed was right. I did even then decide that I would do whatever was required to bring equality and freedom to people. At that time, I saw it as being possible through legal protest activity. But in 1969, I came to believe that I was at a dead end as far as that struggle was concerned. Mm. I remember I was invited to be on a symposium on the future of liberalism, and I came to the conclusion that um, liberalism didn't have a strategy for change in South Africa. And I was about to go overseas to study at Oxford, and even when I was about to go, I had a sense that I was going to do something illegal and violent, I thought. I didn't have clear ideas of what to do. I didn't see any presence of the ANC, although I know now that there was an ANC underground, but it was not very visible to me. But I went overseas with a view to finding a way of coming back, not necessarily with the ANC or the Communist Party, but this thing of joining my life it is a question of, uh, is oppression of other people an intellectual curiosity for you? Or is it something about which you feel as well? And is it something which you are prepared to act on, mm -hmm. on the basis of your understanding and your emotions? So I tried, I didn't, I wouldn't have expressed it this way then, but looking back, I think that uh, taking on the struggle of the oppressed means that you combine your understanding, your emotional uh, commitment, and your uh, willingness to act. Mm. Now, you know, the Catholic Church, I don't know if it's the church as a whole or, uh, or just the youth, they use this phrase, see, judge, act. You see something that's wrong, you make a judgment, and you act. But I don't think judge is good enough because it's not just an intellectual judgment, it's also a moral judgment. And obviously some people understand it that way, but we need to elaborate and explain mm -hmm. it's not just intellectual. I didn't do, I didn't just sit there and reason, and that's a very crucial uh, step to take. Okay. You write that when you decided to join the oppressed, you had to unlearn certain ways of being. What were some of these? 
Well, you know, I didn't at first because when I worked at first, I was working underground and I was on my own. So I could have the same habits as before, more or less. Mm. But I didn't go and I didn't have habits like bumping black people off the pavements and things like that. Those were not my habits mm. anyway. But in the 1980s, when I came out of jail, or let's say even when I was in jail, that was the first time, or well, there'd, there'd been two people working with me a bit, but they were like under my wing, so to speak. So I didn't have to learn special ways for them, although the way I taught them may have been influenced by my new beliefs. But it was mainly in jail and in the UDF that in jail, we had to operate collectively. We had to learn that there's nothing that you do as an individual that is without effect on others. Like if I, if the captain of the prison comes in, you don't just stick up your hand and say, can we have this, can we have that? Because what you ask for may affect the other prisoners mm -hmm. and you don't want to do something that has an effect on them without asking them. But when I came out in the 1980s, that was the period of the UDF. And what I became very aware of is that even though the struggle was a struggle where people came in as equals, they were not in fact equals in terms of the resources at their disposal. I remember after UDF meetings in what was then the Transvaal, I used to give Paul Mashatile a lift to Alex. Now, that example illustrates the different resources. That I, as a white, mm -hmm. was more likely to have a car, more likely to have access to lawyers, more likely to have access to financial resources, all these things. Uh, the same went to a lesser degree for other minority groups, colors and Indians. Uh, so I had to learn to be conscious of the fact that I had resources at my disposal by virtue of being a white. I had had the opportunity to have higher education. Now that meant when I interacted with some people, for example, I would be going to Tsakane, Duduza, these townships, and I couldn't speak in the same way as I spoke uh, in a lecture hall um, because English was not the first language of these people and I also had to listen because what I knew came first from textbooks but what I heard came from the experiences of oppression. Now you can give a name to something as an intellectual but you have to modify all of that when you hear what the experiences mean for people who are suffering it, often you go there thinking the problem of this area is X, but they come back and they say Y and Z and whatever it is, mm -hmm. and the way they express it, the way they voice it, you have to learn to listen. You have to learn to be modest. You have to learn to be, uh, have humility. When I had joined, I was a very successful academic and all I wanted to do was succeed and become this and become that. When I joined the struggle, I decided that my personal ambitions for career were on the sidelines. I had to listen, hear and act on the suffering of the poor. Mm. Now, during your time in the struggle, you were tasked with producing the publication Vukhani. Um, tell us about this publication and how difficult was it to produce and distribute? It wasn't just Vukani. Uh, there was first official publications. There was Inkululeko, Freedom of the Communist Party, and there was Sechabe Sizwe of the um, ANC. Mm -hmm. uh, now, when the, the reason why I was tasked with bringing out Vukani was that um, if they produce something outside the country, it can't respond to what happened yesterday mm. because it takes a long time to get to me. Didn't have internet, things like that. 
Um, and secondly, the, it had to go through a production process, which I was engaged in. And they wanted me to produce for Ghani because uh, they wanted someone who they trusted, because at that stage it was good that they said to me, we can rely on you to interpret the, uh, what the attitude of the ANC and the Communist Party were, was. And I wrote on things like the organization of African unity, <coughs> attitude to African states having relations with South Africa, mm -hmm. things like that. Anyway, to produce a pamphlet, it's not, um, that's underground, it's revolutionary, it's illegal, but it's just, it's very hard work. Mm. First of all, you must buy a typewriter uh, and then not have yourself identified with what you buy. Uh, secondly, because there's a way in which if a uh, way in which they can trace typeface. Secondly, you have to buy envelopes. When you buy the envelopes, you can't touch them with your hands. You have to put either, uh, you have to have some way of covering your fingerprints. And colorless nail varnish is a way of doing it, but it only lasts about 30 minutes and then you've got to put it on again. There was some type of elasto spray that you could use later. At night I could use surgical gloves, mm -hmm. for example. There's very thin surgical gloves. You buy then the um, uh, envelopes. In those days you didn't have photocopying machines. You used a duplicator <coughs> that you used to wind round and round <coughs> and a stencil. You typed on the stencil. And um, Joe Slover had said to me, it doesn't matter if there's a few mistakes and all of that. It doesn't look wonderful because, you know, people will then interpret it as a sort of amateur effort and that's good for people to know that it's not. But when he saw all the mistakes that I had, he said, you know, can't you make it a little bit more tidy? <laughs> but you see, the thing with a stencil is it's not like a computer. Mm. You have to put uh, invisible ink, um, uh, Tipex there, then go over it again, and it was, it, uh, there were so many ruined stencils, it took a long time. Then you make sometimes 1,000, 2,000 copies, sometimes 10,000, and there's a lot of messed up copies. Mm. And you can't just leave them in your flat to be taken out by the dustman, because it's got the subversive message. So I had to get rid of all these things, and it was very hard to get rid of them. Every time you have to get rid of them, you have to avoid your fingerprints being on this. And um, I used to go sometimes underneath these big flats, and then there would be dustbins there, and I'd put it underneath it. That's one place I can remember, but it's very hard to find places. They had thought that I would be able to hire a garage or something and do everything from there it was not possible. I mm -hmm. had to do it all in my flat and that was a very big problem. Um, so then once you've got them ready, you have to then again not putting your fingerprints on them, fold them, put them into envelopes and then post them. Now at first what I used to do is go and take them in two big suitcases say and then dump them all in one or two post boxes. But when I went to London, I was going to an academic conference in the Netherlands. I went to London and I met with Joe Slover and Ronnie Castrols. And I was very impressed with this. They were sitting opposite me, taking notes like students, you see, at the desk. <laughs> and I thought then, this is interesting, it affirmed the how important they thought the work was because mm. there were so few, it was before 76, such a little of this being done. They said to me, you know, it's no good going and dumping everything in one or two post boxes because if they find one, they find the lot. Mm. So they said you must go and take a little bit to one post box, a little bit, and they must look different as well. Not the same envelope, not the same way of typing, all these things. 
So I got to know just about every post box in Durban, you know, and um, it was also something that you had to uh, be willing, uh, be ready to um, be apprehended. And I didn't plan to be apprehended. And people won't believe this of me now. I had a gun, you know, so I was not ready to be apprehended. Uh, so that, uh, you know, if something happened, I was ready to deal with the situation, if necessary, mm. not be taken. And at one on one occasion, you know, I remember the, there's a guy who became a state witness. He writes in uh, his memoirs that I went to a post box and as I was going, a policeman was there and I just walked straight ahead and went and put it in. Now, you know, I, I'd sort of steeled myself mm. for that, but you know, Obviously, I was subconsciously anxious because I remember I mentioned in the book, I locked my keys in my car. Mm. Now, with Volkswagen, it was easy to break into your own car because there's a little window you could just push open. But that sort of thing happened. Uh, but I got to start to get a little bit aware of the danger when I was working with one of these uh, people who became a state witness, and he was getting very scared. And he made me aware what I, of what I had tried to repress, you mm. see, although I carried on. So what led to your arrest in 1975? Um, you know, they didn't know everything that I was doing, but the problem with doing this work is that you've got to get funding. and. It was very hard to get funding to do a big thing. Mm. And uh, buying the safest way of buying envelopes is say to go to the CNA and buy 100 here, 100 there. And I was going to bring out 10,000 copies of the Freedom Charter. And I went to buy, uh, I, they hadn't got me money yet, because I was using my own money. And I went to buy at some factory and unfortunately, I had to give my real name there. Mm. And then, unfortunately, also, the envelopes didn't just have a blank back. I hadn't seen this when I ordered them. They had a name there. So when the police got these, they went and arrested this chap. Uh, and then he was, he didn't want to say who it was, but then he, he admitted that it was me. And then, I don't know exactly the coordination, or exactly when they found that, because they followed me. You now, I think they may have known, but they w wanted to see if I was going to post again. And that, the night they arrested me, I went to Maritzburg, came back, and these other two also went posting. And when I came back to my house, uh, they closed in on me. Mm. Blocked, blocked me in. Now, once in custody, what was your mindset towards the inevitable torture? You know, I don't think torture is inevitable because um, it depends. If you decide that you will tell them everything, uh, then you don't get tortured. And But I knew that I had told these other two that they must get out of the country once they hear I've been arrested. Mm. Um, and I didn't know very much else. I had done a few other things, like I had had something to do with this trial of Justice Mpanza, uh, MK Grillite, d done something. They'd asked me to do something in connection with that. I later got charged with that as well. But um, the so there wasn't much that they knew, uh, that they wanted to know, except who else was doing this. Mm. And when I was arrested, I didn't have a lecture the next day at the university, so that maybe no one would know I'd been arrested. So when they were torturing me, and that they did torture me, I thought, let, them, let me provoke this early, because what I had heard, because I'd spoken to a lot of people, is that Sometimes you hold out and you hold out and you hold out and you're so tired that you end up telling them not only what they 
uh, want to know, but even things they're not asking about. Mm. I thought, let me get tortured now when my faculties are strong. Mm. And uh, I said to them, I was anyone who had been posting, and I said, let's go and look for these. Um, uh, we go and I'll go and point out the places uh, where I posted. And I point out where I had posted, and I point out where I guessed they had posted. And uh, at a certain point during the torture, I said to them, I want to tell you where I've got some pamphlets hidden. Now, there was a storeroom adjoining an office of a colleague. And in that storeroom, behind certain things, I had hidden, I think I'd hidden pamphlets or I'd hidden some, some, some material. And uh, they then would have to raid the university to get that. When they raided the university, everyone knew they'd been arrested mm -hmm. and these people should have left, but they didn't leave. The one person actually had some pamphlets, he tried to throw them down the drain or something, and then they both got arrested. I didn't know that at first, and they, but I, I got to sense that they had been arrested because certain questions came, which could only have come from them. You see, how they may have got onto them is in some ways, some of what was stored could possibly have led to them, I don't know. Mm. But they were supposed to have gone immediately and they hung around which uh, had a danger anyway. But then after a while, as I say, there was questions coming that could only have come from one of these people. Uh, and then um, I didn't know what was happening exactly, uh, whether they'd continue torturing me or not. Mm. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. That was researcher and analyst Professor Raymond Sattner discussing his book Inside Apartheid's Prison.